Welcome to the No More Late Fees podcast. I'm Danielle. And I'm Jackie. And we're just two best friends and ex-Blockbuster employees, re-watching some of our favorite movies from the late 90s and early 2000s. It's my birthday week! So Happy excited. Happy birthday, Danielle! <laughs> <laughs> if you know me, I'm sorry. <laughs> because <laughs> then you know... I'm completely obsessed with my birthday. And so we're doing a special early edition of my birthday episode. And we are doing one of my all-time favorites, Crooklyn. Now, normally Jackie and I stick to the years of 1995 through 2005, but because it's my birthday and I do what I want, we're going to do Crooklyn. (laughs) (laughs) It's on the border. It's 1994. It's not that far out. And Crooklyn is a Spike Lee movie that came out in 94, as I said, and it features many up and coming stars or 90s stars that we see later on. And it's focusing on the family, the Carmichaels, uh, with the mom, dad, with five kids. (laughs) (laughs) um living in Brooklyn in the 1970s now the movie never kind of goes into what year it is but you can kind of guess that it's um probably 1974 I think and it follows this wonderful adorable child named Troy and just her living her best summer life in Brooklyn New York so Super excited. If you want to watch this movie, I think I saw it on Amazon Prime, but that's because I have a Stars subscription. And Jackie, how did you watch it? I purchased it for $14.99 on iTunes. Well, before we get started, we have to do our ratings rewind. So you know the drill. Before we get into the movie, we'll reveal the rating our Y2K versions of ourselves we give. Then at the end, we'll see if our current selves agree with our initial rating. Our scale will consist of would buy it or would buy it again. The best would play it on repeat. Five day rental. Would watch again. Two day rental. Okay, but nothing to write home about. And same day rental. Garbage explosion. Trash. (laughs) Danielle, give me your rating. Uh, Y2K rating. Uh, would buy it, would buy it again. It was definitely one of those movies that kind of defined shaping like my childhood, shaping who I was being seen on a movie screen in a way. So yeah, hundred percent. One of my favorite movies. How about you, Jackie? Well, there's a first time for everything. <laughs> And I can't give a rating because I watched the movie for the first time last night. Look at me still culturing you. That's all right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to hear what your rating is going to be as in present self. So that'll be interesting. This movie resonates with me so much because I grew up in Brooklyn and didn't move to Florida until I was about 10, but I went back and forth between Florida and New York because of family like my dad lived there my grandma lived there so the whole premise of this movie definitely resonates with me and it makes me think of my parents because they both grew up in New York and in the 70s and so I have different memories watching this with both of them separately so it's uh, very nostalgic for me But the cool thing about this movie is that it's semi-autobiographical for the Lees. Um, Obviously, Spike Lee directed this movie, and this was coming right after he finished Malcolm X, and that movie was draining for him. Nonetheless, uh, he was exhausted, and he wanted to do something a little bit smaller, more lighthearted. And his sister, let me make sure I pronounce her name properly. So she grew up being called Joey but she likes to be called Juvois. I I probably still messed it up. And their brother, Sonique Lee, they both were writing a pilot to be a kid show on Nickelodeon um, that didn't test well, apparently. And so they went to their brother asking if he knew anybody that would, you know, make this into a show or a movie. And he said, you know what? I'll make it. 
So it's pretty interesting because it really is from the point of view of Troy, the main character, who is the girl, the only girl of four other brothers in the middle somewhere there. And um, so you're really living through Troy's eyes, but Joey's eyes, who who wrote the screenplay for this movie. So um, let's get into it. <laughs> so the movie starts out, you get a good feel for the neighborhood itself. You see all these people kind of sitting on the stoop. You see def- different cultures and that that's definitely one of the best things about Brooklyn, especially in that time period where you kind of had a melting pot of all these different cultures kind of having to live together. Not, not to say that there wasn't some sort of segregation and in, in you go one block, you're in a completely Hasidic Jewish area, you turn to the next, you're in an Italian neighborhood, you turn to the next, you're in a Black neighborhood. But a lot of the times it was a mixture and you can kind of get that feel as you're seeing some of the characters on the block. Um, and it and, seemed like the adults kind of had those preconceived prejudices towards one another, whereas the kids kind of all just played together. Yeah, they played to, they played together, but they did carry some of those prejudices because yes. you can hear them like mocking each other with really derogatory <laughs> um, terms uh, and not just with different cultures, but within the black culture, if you're really Mm -hmm. listening, you can hear some colorism and and some other nuances there. Um, But you definitely see all the really fun games. And that just like made me reminisce about all the block parties we used to have growing up um, and playing outside double Dutch. And we used to really play outside. It's kind of like how now and then in those in in that movie you can kind of see Mm -hmm. them playing all those games um so if you watch some of them they're exactly how we played them spike lee actually had to teach the kid those games because they didn't they didn't know what they were they didn't know how to play them they didn't know what the like how it went so he would have to take time to teach them how to do it so that was kind of funny and it, it was interesting to see some of the games because some are um games that everyone's fairly familiar with like yeah. the double dutch and things like that but some you could tell were just like made up out of complete and sheer boredom and like <laughs> whatever you had access to is like what you used and you just created games to have fun and play with your your neighbors yeah um i loved how the older boys were playing um like a baseball game but it was <laughs> it was just like it was a dice game. Yeah, it was, I I had never seen that before, but you know, the, the older kids were doing one thing. The girls were in their little section and, Mm -hmm. um, uh, Troy's little braids and her beads. And it was very seventies. Like you could see even in the prints of like, um, Troy's pillowcase and stuff like Mm -hmm. that, it all gave me flashbacks of to like stuff that my mom still kept and had. So Yes. Um, so you see everybody in the neighborhood and then obviously you hear Troy's mom calling her and we're introduced to the wonderful Alfre Woodard, who is like an amazing actress. And so she plays Caroline. And then later on, you meet Delroy Lindo, who's Woody, the dad, and he's a musician. Really he blows f- a horn to call the kids <laughs> for dinner. <Yeah. laughs> Which, I mean, then it gives a different insight when you're watching because you you have to think, okay, this is kind of based on Spike Lee's dad. And if you know a little bit of history about them in Mo' Better Blues, he, his other, one of his other movies, he had his dad actually play most of the music in that movie. And they had a very contentious relationship. I think they were able to fix things, but it comes into significance later because you have to imagine the oldest son is Spike. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so pretty much you, you meet, you meet the mom and you really just go through their, their everyday um, existence of kids kind of fighting with each other. They had one TV in, mm-hmm. in Troy's room. They're fighting over who gets like, which episodes they get to watch or what shows they're watching. And I like that they took a, you know, they were, it's a democracy where yes. they got to vote and of course the three youngest kids wanted to watch the partridge family and the boys wanted to watch the knicks 
So I, I just thought that was funny because my mom used to tell me stories about her and my, my uncle and they would fight all the time about which shows that they wanted to watch. And it was an interesting family dynamic for me. Um, just seeing how the way they communicated with each other was kind of like the bickering, fighting, even the parents, they kind of just, it, it was a lot of yelling and not in a bad way. It's just, that was their communication style was yelling. Um, and so it, it was not something I was used to seeing, but yeah. you know, there's families like that, that that's how they communicate. Yeah, I feel like the parents were like both very calm when they talked to each other. I think Mm -hmm. you did see some very realistic relationship um, insights when they're fighting about like money and keeping things together and just the dynamics of, you know, the dad wanting to kind of be the man and Mm -hmm. but he wasn't earning the money to be able to kind of feel like he was in that position and not feeling right. respected while the mom was really just trying to like make everything work. And yeah, so you see some real conversations happening and arguments that kind of seep into dealing with the kids as well. Yeah. I, I, I have, I'm going to have some questions that just come out <laughs> of like, I don't know. And I, I, and I want to learn. Um, so was her hair actually beaded like that? Or was that a wig? I don't, I have no idea. I, I don't know. Because it was very, very intricate. It was, I could imagine that she could get her hair braided like that, but I'm not sure because I don't know. I just feel like it was taken out. Yeah. I feel like it could have been either or if, if I imagine they were shooting in summer in Brooklyn, I wouldn't want a wig. I mean, you might as well just braid it, you know? And the, you know, braiding it would have lasted longer. So yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I have no idea. So uh, pretty much after you, you, you're introduced to everybody, you're kind of seeing the ins and outs. You have a, one of those scenes where um, they're eating at the table. And I feel like I could relate to this because Black Eyed Peas are not my favorite thing to eat. <laughs> and I didn't experience this in my home be with my mom because my mom's side is Jamaican but like my dad's side is from Georgia and so when I would go to like my aunts and stuff I would be the last kid sitting at the table because I did not want to eat my collard greens or my black eyed peas did you you puke on the plate I didn't but (laughs) that scene just gave me flashbacks Um, but yeah, um, that- and, and they put an obscene amount of sugar in that lemonade. First of all, back up. <laughs> <laughs> I like sugar and I like sweet things, but that was like half the five pound bag of sugar in that. Becky, lemonade. That's how black people make their Kool-Aid and the juice. Okay. <laughs> that's just how we do it. We put all sorts of flavor. We make sure, I mean, it, if it ain't a whole bunch of sugar, it ain't, it's not lemonade. I don't know what that is. <laughs> and then I, I don't understand the Troy peeing on the floor in the middle of the night. Yeah. So I'm thinking that she probably just pulled out a random like scenario that probably happened. So like Troy's in her, be- in her bed and I think it's almost like a sleepwalking situation. Yes. She's going instead of going to the bathroom, she goes into her brother's room and just pees on the floor. And he's uh, just the way he reacted to it. He was just like, Troy, (laughs) what are you doing? This is not the bathroom. And she still doesn't quite wake up. And I love like, it's a funny scene, but then like, they don't address it. Like, no, Nate doesn't say like, mom, Troy peed in the on the floor like in the little one is such a tattletale I would have imagined he would have immediately when mama woke them up at 4 a.m because they didn't clean the kitchen I would have imagined him be like but tripping on the floor over here so she needs to match (laughs) that whole scene so after they eat dinner the um Caroline says to the rest of the kids you know clean up you're going to clean up this kitchen which was always like this argument 
especially with the oldest, you know, they always had something to say. And she's like, we're going all out to your dad's show, clean it up. So I'm assuming she, the dad just goes to sleep and then she goes in the kitchen and finds out that they didn't clean the kitchen properly. Mm-hmm. That too was um, deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> I know my brother, sister, and I have experienced multiple versions of that with Christine being hella pissed that the kitchen was not clean. Yeah. Um, so she wakes them up at like four in the morning. She wakes their all their little asses up and just starts yelling at them. And then she looks at the oldest and is just like, I expect more out of you because you're the oldest. And oh, that hit that hit home. I used to hate in that. The yeah, it's like, damn, fuck these kids. <laughs> <That's not laughs> my fault. I used to feel like that with my younger brothers too, like with my dad when I was with them, and I'd just be so annoyed that you know you can't control them, little bastards mm-hmm. all over the place. Um, so after that scene, we are introduced to the two dudes, Huff and Glue, that kind of I guess <laughs> down the the kids in the neighborhood. <laughs> So it is Snuffy, who is played by Spike Lee, and then Right Hand Man, played by N. Jeremy Duru. And so you just see them like pouring super glue into a paper bag and just taking turns and getting high as shit on a stoop. It wouldn't be Brooklyn if you didn't have the local drug heads (laughs) wandering around, and it wouldn't be a Spike Lee movie if Spike wasn't in the movie somehow. So true. Yeah, they and they scare they scare Troy like Mm -hmm. she has bad dreams about them a lot. And that one scene where they like get her high. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, that dream she has where they force her to huff glue. I was just like, oh, this makes me feel really weird. I don't like. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so we were introduced to them and. The kids are playing a game and then they just come out of nowhere and just like, give us your money. And yeah, one one of the kids fights back because (laughs) they like the guy's shoe gets messed up and he lost his shoe. (laughs) The heel of his shoe falls off (laughs) and then he blames the kids. I'm like, well, why don't you use the fucking glue you're huffing to fix your goddamn shoe? I mean, how desperate are you to just start sniffing glue, man? Oh my gosh. And then, oh, we we skipped where the neighbor, uh, Tony Eyes. Tony Eyes. Those bottle cap glasses, man. Oh my God. And the, the amount of dogs he had in his house, that is he was, just not sanitary at he all. He was crazy. He was very crazy. But the kids... So like they tortured him. <laughs> so they have this neighbor and he's just not right in the mind, you know, mental awareness people. Like at that time, I'm sure there was no empathy for and the it, fact it seemed that like he, he lived help. with his elderly mom. He blames the Carmichael family, the mom, Carolyn, especially for killing his mom. He insinuates yeah. at one point. Yeah. Uh, but he has like, seven tiny dogs in his house and he plays really really horrible it's not unusual to be loved by anyone but not that good no and the (laughs) fact that me singing that was better than him just tells you a lot about how bad it was yes um and then he's constantly so the Carmichael children, I feel, are not innocent in this situation <laughs> by any means, but they're slowly driving him more and more insane because he's like, they keep throwing trash on my stoop. And the mom's <laughs> like, my fucking kids aren't doing that. And at one point he's like, they keep throwing rocks at my dogs from the roof. And the mom's like, they're not Untrue. doing that. And it shows <laughs> literally pelting the dogs with like tiny rocks from the roof of the the um brownstone i'm just like i don't i don't know what's happening (laughs) yeah like that's that's one of the things that i love about my mom like even if somebody says something that we're doing that's wrong even if she knows we did it she'd be like that is not true now when we get home it's a whole nother (laughs) scenario but i do love how she she's like my children are not liars she knows that they're lying she knows but she's not going to say that in front of him. And I mean, that scene where the dad catches him throwing 
the garbage back onto their mm -hmm. like but we have to talk about um the time that they're um, one of the tenants in the Carmichael's um brownstone who's played by Isaiah Washington Dr. Burke yes <laughs> Dr. That's Burke from Grey's Anatomy Dr. Burke <laughs> um early in his career before the whole scandal of Grey's yes um he plays this just random tenant in their house and um he comes out because Caroline Carmichael and Tony are like going at it because he's blamed her kids yet again for throwing the trash into his, his little section of his house. And um, he comes out to like mitigate the whole situation. He screams at everyone, tells them to shut up. He turns to Tony and I don't even think he says more than two words to him. And Tony's just still blathering on and he just knocks him out. Like it, it was wasn't even a it wasn't even a punch. It was a slap. Was he it? He slapped the bottle, uh, <laughs> Coke bottle glasses off of Tony. The lenses go flying out. And um, then he knows he's in some deep shit. The funny thing about that is that like the other kid, the neighborhood kids, like everybody comes out at this point mm -hmm. during this altercation. And the, the neighborhood kids are on the floor trying to get the glasses, but you know it's not to help Tony. No. You know it's to like probably smash it or hide it from him. We can burn some ants with these. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure. So I know they go back in the house. I'm not sure if this is where the mom and the dad get in a fight because I know mm -hmm. Troy afterwards gets money to go get some candy. And yeah. then she sees um, RuPaul dancing with some dudes. <laughs> yeah, but um, but afterwards she sees the and um, she sees Isaiah Isaiah's uh, Vic Vic get arrested. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if it's the same instance where they get in a fight. Do the parents fight and then she gets the quarter? Is that the next day? No, uh, no. I think I'm mixing up two two events. But um, at some point, she does go to the corner store, which is, again, a, a staple of any New York kid being able to go down to the bodega or to the corner store and get some candy for real cheap. And we are introduced to RuPaul in her, in his glory. In his her, glory. She's in drag, so. She, sure. Oh, well, in her glory. <laughs> um, and she says, <laughs> dancing with some uh, uh, with tito just some guy from the neighborhood i'm assuming i don't mm -hmm. think he works there they're just dancing in the the aisle <laughs> <of> the <bodega. laughs> and she goes i'm connie i keeps my panties clean as I, they're dancing she's like i ain't no puta i keep my <laughs> panties clean <laughs> and i'm just like yeah i could imagine that actually happening randomly and then at the end, she says, no ticky, no talky, Tito. <laughs> and I guess that's a euphemism for you better have money if we're going to continue this night. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I just love that she's just randomly in that movie. Yeah. It, well, it you was know, a great You know, cameo. my love for, for RuPaul goes deep. So <laughs> yeah. I'm very happy to see her. <laughs> and then after that, we see Vic getting arrested, which, you know, got to show the consequences. You can't just be bitch slapping people. Mm. You know, Tony called Popo. Oh, yeah. <sighs> so let's talk about the different kids that Troy interacts with. Uh, they're all kind of sitting on the stoop doing each other's hair and the one girl whose hair is pointed straight up mm -hmm. has the audacity mm -hmm. to comment in a derogatory fashion about Troy's hair like she's starting to touch Troy's hair and she's like don't do that yeah. and so then she gets you know offended and what what do what does she do she attacks by talking shit about her hair yeah and so they all go back and forth talking about each other's hair and yeah that's that's pretty normal <laughs> and in that environment it does happen um, and then that's when we get introduced to Troy's it seems like one of Troy's only friends Winnie mm -hmm. yeah who is someone calls her a Peter Rican 
<laughs> I don't know what is wrong with these kids. <laughs> and then they do comment on Winnie's hair, how she thinks her hair is beautiful and stuff like that, because it's just a different texture than. Well, I mean, we can go into a deep yeah. dive into the whole process of calling hair good hair or bad hair and mm-hmm. colorism and racism and all sorts of, you know, things, but let's not do that but yeah (laughs) they do they do start touching Winnie's hair she again she also says please don't touch my hair Mm -hmm. and uh then they start to go in on her saying that she thinks she's better than everybody yeah so you see so many it's such a nuanced conversation that's happening between all of these kids all these you know young girls and what I love is that they start fighting and calling each other's n- names. And then they're like, okay, you ready to, to, Let's go to double play Dutch. double Dutch? <laughs> like They don't care. The other part of that scene is that the oldest girl, she's eating an apple, putting salt on it. And I learned mm-hmm. that when I went, used to go to Georgia for the summers and I came back with that and my mom lost her shit. She was <laughs> like, this is how you get high blood pressure. And I was like, I'm 10. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was eating a tomato. Uh, it was an apple. Okay. But yeah, it's like a thing in the South to put salt on sweet things like apples and watermelon. Don't know why, but it actually tastes pretty good. So, <laughs> and then, okay. So back after Vic gets arrested, uh, Troy goes back upstairs to her brothers who are watching TV, the Partridge family and i woke up in love this morning <laughs> I, I love woke that up part. in love this morning because oh. you know my family are singers and we randomly break out into songs so that <laughs> the fact that all five kids are like fighting and all of a sudden they're like here's the good part and they all break out in unison <laughs> singing and then like go back to fighting loved it she did say she told her brothers after they were trying to snatch her candy Psych your mind, make your booty shine. Yeah. I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, that is definitely some 70s shit for sure. <laughs> um, but what I love is the, is the dynamic is that she comes back with the candy and her younger sibling, who's smaller than her, he's asking for candy. She's like, beat it. No. And he goes to try to tell on her, but mom, the mom is gone. The uh, way he hollers down those stairs. <laughs> I'm like, bitch you need to be put in your place stop all the fucking tattletaling is someone hurt or bleeding (laughs) or vomiting don't be a snitch (laughs) youngest the youngest are always snitches please (laughs) um so he goes to snitch and troy's like mom's not home so eh." (laughs) here comes the older brothers i love how the older the oldest brothers just snatch her stuff yeah they i think they ask first and she's not trying to share and she's like showing out and then they show her the pecking order. And mm-hmm. I love how like they push her to the bed like three times as she keeps getting up. And that <laughs> reminded me of fighting with my brothers, even though they're younger than me, but they were bigger. So not and, fun. And uh, the oldest brother calls her an evil flat chested wench. Yes. She gives her a complex about <laughs> being flat chested, which we see later on. Well, he's not the first person to say something about that. Again, I don't know that life because I was never a flat chested wench. So the flat chested part, at least. <laughs> We're still wenches. Dan. Yeah. The wench <laughs> just part. Just embrace it. <laughs> the wench part. Yes. The flat chested, not so much. <laughs> they eventually change the channel, don't they? No, no. The mom starts. She yell at them for watching. Yeah, TV. she can. She can hear the TV through the wall and. By this point, it seems like they're not out for summer break yet. They're it's a school, school night. So she's like, it's a school night. You better not have that TV on. So then they turn it real low and then they're still singing in like a whisper. <laughs> I really love to. And then we go to the bodega again. The girls have no money, but they want treats. Uh, that life. <laughs> and so Winnie goes in gets like an ice cream, puts it up her shirt and walks out. No problem. Well, Troy decides she doesn't want something sweet. She wants something more savory and grabs a crinkly ass bag of chips. That's real puffy and puts it up. The, up Everyone shirt. knows you let the air out of the bag first, <laughs> then you hide it under your shirt. Hello. 
but let's so, not go ahead. <laughs> go ahead let's not forget that Winnie could have literally stole a watermelon out of there and still had got it not gotten in trouble because yeah. clearly those are her people in in that store like as soon as she walks in that random man tries to like get him to get get her to kiss him on the cheek which I thought was weird oh so gross and she's like get the hell out of here I don't think I don't know if they're related she doesn't call him uncle or anything it's Mm -hmm. just like they're familiar with each other so I think it didn't matter at that point like yeah Choi was kind of dumb with what she chose but she would have gotten in trouble regardless and then this is one of no, it's not the first scene. I think the chair is just in the background, but it was when I first noticed they actually have a barber chair in their house because mm-hmm. mom has to do everyone's hair. Yep. Um, which I had never thought about. And so I, th- I thought that was an interesting detail. Yeah. And I could imagine that the mom seems like she's got a good hustler mentality that she mm-hmm. probably did other people's hair to make some yeah. extra cash as well. Like, you know, she was always thinking outside of the, bo- the box to try mm-hmm. to just make things work. So they come back. She doesn't have a snack. <laughs> they come back. But um, I think that whole scene where they were, it was a school night and. This is when the mom uh, confronts the dad about bouncing checks. So, yeah, she's trying to do the budget. She's trying to stay on the budget. And anybody who's ever been in a relationship where you're probably the good one with money and the other person isn't, it is like the most frustrating thing. Um, when, especially when you're just trying to get them to communicate with you, like, it's not even that you're mad that they use the money. You're mad Mm -hmm. that you're not telling me we have a tight budget. It's not like this, this bank account's overflowing with money and you could just use checks whenever, like if you use a check, that means that something I, a check I put in, is going to make my check bounce or you put your check in and there's nothing there. Right. Because I didn't know to put some money in there for your check. Mm -hmm. And so they get into this argument and it kind of, it shifts from the Caroline's perspective of like, I just need you to communicate. And I'm kind of like, she's, she even mentions that she's going to get a separate bank account, but she does it after they kind of like, it seems like the argument's dying down. And then she's Mm -hmm. like, I'm just (laughs) going to get a separate bank account. And so it like starts things up again. Um, And he's just- he feels attacked as a man yeah uh for spending the money and bouncing the checks and she's like that's not what this is about I just right. need to we need to have money for like our utilities and our house budget and now you're bouncing checks which probably come with fees and, yeah yeah it's not and good. like we, I recognize you're trying to work on your music career, but you're not bringing in money. I'm the only one bringing in money right now. So, yeah. And so it's shifted from just a conversation, a communication issue to his bruised feeling, ego. his bruised ego, e- eagle, his bruised <laughs> ego and feeling inadequate, his mm-hmm. inadequacies. But that have less to do with other people and more how he's viewing himself at that point in time. Yes. It's really hard to be a creative and you have this passion, but it's not necessarily bringing in the money when you have real literally seven mouths to feed. So Mm -hmm. they really start getting into it. And then I don't know if this is just like what moms do, but as they're arguing about one thing, they start to hone into some other thing. Let me spread this joy around. And so <laughs> Caroline hears the TV yet again on a school night. She calls at them and tells them to like turn it down. And the kid is real fresh with that mouth. I'll tell you that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> She's like, what? And so they try to turn it down, but she of course comes up there and she really is ready to like fight with him mm-hmm. because he is just being really disrespectful. Um, and the dad just wants to be like a pacifist and not want to, you know, things to be stirred up. And it just mm-hmm. goes like, he's trying to deescalate things, but it just turns the really bad. Grabs him yeah. His life. He about, he about hulling, to lose his life. Hulling him out of the room. And so the dad, Woody comes in to kind of break that up. 
And so he starts dragging the mom out and hurts her ankle. And then she kicks him out of the house. Yeah. Well, they all start to fall down the stairs and then the kids start changing sides. Like she was just ready to whoop their ass, Mm -hmm. but they're mad at the dad because they feel like he's hurting her because she's like falling down the stairs and like not just her ankle but like mm-hmm. you can tell her 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 back and ass are probably not doing so well yeah um so she tells him yeah get the step in call your brother call tyrone and get your <laughs> shit <laughs> um, and gtfo yeah ken did say at this point well, the guy is being a big jerk. He bounced five checks in one month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he is. And she's been trying to be patient. She loves this mm-hmm. man. Like she yeah. loves him and she supports his, his lifestyle. But um, enough is enough at this point with yeah. the amount of stress. And I think it does such a good job of portraying, you know, the, the black Real life conflict, email conflict struggle yeah yeah of having sometimes not everybody but carrying the load of so mm-hmm. many different things then troy asked for doesn't she ask for an, a quarter again like isn't she trying to go back in the streets to go to the store no, so is uncle that the comes, next thing yeah uncle comes okay. gets dad Dad comes back the next day with like a, a couple of roses and a vase and a note for mom he knows better than to enter that house (laughs) so he gives it to troy to deliver to her mom the apology note and the flowers and then also gives her some spending money yeah he well she wants to he wants to take the mom out on a date so yes and the mom i thought it was really nice when she was like is everybody still is everybody mad at me like the kids because you know the kids were like some of the kids the boys were blaming her for the dad being gone um but eventually he comes back I guess they make up because uh the the morning after he's made breakfast for the family and the kids Mm -hmm. are all giving him a hard time because it's probably not as good as when mom makes it yeah which is like the complete opposite of what it was like for me because my dad was such a good cook so (laughs) my mom hated cooking she was good at it but not like he was really good at it so I actually preferred when he cooked. So when when Troy gets that money, no, is it? No, so she gets mad at the brother and takes his nick <gasps> Let and me, his and his buffalo nipples. Let me just say that that hurt my soul when I saw <laughs> that scene. Like I don't when I first watched it when I was younger, I didn't get it. But now as an adult, knowing how much those things are worth. So I could imagine like he was ready to kill her because he just thought she took the Knicks tickets. Yeah. I don't and know. And then wh- she tattled on herself. <laughs> he was, she was like, oh, by the way, those crusty ass nickels you got that you think are so special. Yeah, took them too. And she bought herself ice cream, her and Winnie ice cream. And she's sitting inside and it, this is before anyone knows that she like took the Knicks tickets or the Buffalo nickels and she's sitting inside eating her ice cream cone and Gilda's brothers walks in and like shoves her head and her eye goes right in that ice cream cone. I was like, Oh God damn. And he does this before he even knows that she took his Knicks tickets. He's just being an asshole older brother. I was like, Oh, you, you can never be. (laughs) <laughs> relaxed in that house you never know when the attacks are coming no and can we talk about the fact that the oldest son is actually bokeem Wood- woodbine like i i still he was I, so tall and scrawny like yeah i don't know how that happened yeah um and then the only other thing about that scene there so at one point troy is outside playing with the other kids and they're doing like the touch your shoes and like spell things (laughs) game that kids play that's an interesting way to call it okay you are out game (laughs) you are not it yeah (laughs) you guys never did that you never did those games where you would just just occasionally like we did more of like the clapping like the miss mary mac type Mm -hmm. thing but not the 
just you're out for no reason. <laughs> there was uh, no, yeah, I, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> one of the chants was there's a German in the grass with a bottle up his ass <laughs> and something about it going in and out. And oh my I was like, God. that's an interesting chant for children. Yeah, some of the chants, like I never, you never think about it as a kid. Like you don't know why you're singing it. You don't know where they, where it comes from, but you just know the words, you just learn it and it is what it is. But now yeah. when I like think back at some of them, I'm like, whoa, what the hell what is the hell that? You're saying, yeah. <laughs> this is when we've seen Greg around. It seems like Greg has a crush on Troy. Oh and my it is god! Not reciprocal. <laughs> Greg is a, a kid from the neighborhood, and apparently, at first, I thought Greg was lying just because he was a stalker and wanted attention <laughs> from Troy's mom. <laughs> Turns out that's not the case. And Troy was bullying him. And she was like a whole like head and a half shorter than him. And he's like, uh, Miss Carmichael, Troy's being like through the window. Troy's being mean to me. She calls me names. She calls my mom names. She she did straight up call his mom a hoe in yeah, one of she the said, scenes. Sorry, I called your mother a hoe. <laughs> like, oh. Well, maybe Troy isn't as innocent. She had me fooled. No, I really think that it's not like she just went after him and bullied him. If you notice, he's always trying, like they threw a cat, like him and his friend. Oh my gosh, cat. I can't believe I forgot about the fucking cat. <laughs> they Towards pick the up be- this poor Towards- black cat and yeah. they start swinging him from his tail. <laughs> tail. When, when they were cornering the cat, I was like, what y'all doing with that cat? What? What, what's going on I, this can't be good news for the cat either the cat is going to be shaved or <laughs> killed or something bad is happening to that fucking cat and the cat was swung by its tail and thrown into a double dutch session at the girls <laughs> and it lands on one of the girls and you know if that cat was an alley cat and had nails it was scratching the hell out of her oh my gosh i was horrified at that scene yeah and- the way they treated that cat (laughs) so I really think that he was always picking on Troy like you said probably because he liked her Mm -hmm. and um she wasn't having it you don't mess with Troy she's got four brothers you think she's gonna be taking it from some wreck you know regular street urchin no she's gonna stick up for herself and so she she got really good at calling him names and and you know telling him that he was held back three times (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> telling him to get the step in and um so he goes and snitches to the mom and she makes him apologize and so she does but man she ain't done the mm-hmm. next day well no was it the next day it's probably that same day later on that day she goes upstairs you see her filling up a bucket with hot scolding water and you're I thought she was about to clean. Like, I didn't it was, know. It was the next day because it was after she sent to the store. Right, to go get the, okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll get back to the store story. But she, yeah. the next day, he's sitting on her stoop with a bunch of other people and she gets that bucket of water and she throws it outside and hits him scalding. right good. Yes, scalding hot fucking water. And she's assault. like, and stay off my stoop, bitch. <laughs> that is full-on assault troy (laughs) (laughs) gangster that's why i feel like this movie i just felt i felt like somebody saw me like i felt (laughs) seen because we um mom sends troy to the store with food stamps that were given to the family by the tenants yeah as part of their like rent and any kid, I'm sure at that time frame, you know, she was embarrassed to have yeah. food stamps, but her mom made a good point. Like, girl, they all have food stamps. Get the hell out of here and go get that dinner. You know, yeah. like, I ain't got time for this. So then Troy decides she's just going to steal rather than use the food stamps because that's how embarrassed she is. Um, and she gets away with it because yeah. at the same time, Peanut another girl from the the block is in the grocery store attempting to steal and the shop owner 
catches her so Troy's able to like sneak out with her what what did she say liver and onions yeah um, oh I hate liver so much <laughs> and but as soon as she gets outside peanut has been thrown out she ready to whoop that ass outside oh and peanut just goes after her and the the um food stamps are in the breast pocket of Troy's little shirt and so peanuts ne- like wrestles with her snatches her food stamps away from her they get into a scuffle the shop owner comes out separates them peanut walks off and then troy does <laughs> what like my favorite action of hers in the whole movie because it's such a kid thing to do apparently in the scuffle peanut drops her bracelet like a just it seems like an elastic beaded bracelet and mm-hmm. Troy holds it up and like shakes it at her and like makes a face <laughs> and then drops it on the ground like you ain't got look at what I got yeah I, I just love it because it's such a, a perfect detail of like what a kid would do in retaliation in that situation even though she got her ass whooped she had to have that the last line, even if it was nonverbal. Yeah. <laughs> and I love how like the store owner's like helping her or well, the worker, I don't know what his steal was, but he doesn't even say, oh, you walked out of here without paying for this. He was just like, okay, about your way. And then she goes yeah. home and throws that stuff on the table and's like, told you not to send me to the store. I also just think like that was the cool thing about New York, especially at that time. It's still now the stores are down the street like kids could just Mm -hmm. go and do whatever for the parent like run errands like they I just felt feel like kids that grow up in New York are so much more independent and probably grow up a little bit faster but they have more experience with just with responsibilities because they can and I Mom has no sympathy that she was robbed no. of her food or food she's Like stamps. he lost my food stamps. The hell. And she got, and then she's like, oh, Peanut's a girl. Why didn't you take her? And <laughs> Troy goes, she was 6'2, 200 pounds. <laughs> and her brother corroborates that story that oh Peanut is nothing to mess with. <laughs> I feel like my mom would have taken that opportunity to say, you tell me where this girl lives, because we both mm-hmm. gonna go whoop that ass. Yep. Um, and so then the next scene is they're eating dinner right afterwards and they're talk. the dad's back they're eating mm-hmm. dinner and then they're talking about traveling and visiting people right family yeah the cousins in the country in Virginia I think um, which at the beginning of the, the movie mom had mentioned to Troy that she wanted her to go stay with her cousin for the summer which is like a very normal thing for a lot of black kids growing up in that time period, even my time period, where you would go down south for the summer or they would come up to to New York, but usually you were going down south for the summer. Um, And this has a lot to do with the great migration that happened for African-Americans, about like 6 million African-Americans moved out of like rural the rural South and moved to the Northeast, to New York, to Maryland. Mm -hmm. They were moving out of the South to get, you know, more industrial jobs, corporate jobs. And so you have that split within your family. You, every black person I know has some family that lives down South. (laughs) It's just what happens. And Um, this is when the electricity is turned off. The guy shows up, they're packing the car to go to the country yeah and the electrician or the guy who works for the power company comes to turn off their electricity for Mm non-payment and it turns out woody the dad was in charge of that bill and and he swears he paid it and it's just kind of fucking with them but um yeah so they have to get candles and stuff like that and And then uh uh, vic and his girlfriend come home vic is the tenant played by um, isaiah washington isaiah washington and he gets really mad like I would be mad and I would be asking for a discount on my rent for however many days I'm without electricity. Yeah. The dad's like, we got these candles here. (laughs) Give this to you. It'll be on in a couple of days. And Vic starts going off about his disability. 
he I need light for my disability I'm like what disability <laughs> do you have that you need light we don't I don't and, know and you have light like candlelight is still light it may not be overhead lights I don't know something about the light triggered him for sure <laughs> Um, which but, I mean, granted, I would be pissed if I'm paying rent, they gave them their food stamps and everything to help offset costs. And then you come home to no electricity, 100% upset about that. But like, what can you do about it? Right. You can't threaten to move out. Like, yeah. Just ask for a discount and move on. <laughs> well, they still leave the next day. They're out yeah. that bit. <laughs> Um, and they go to drive Troy to visit her cousin. <laughs> well, it's um, it's actually Woody's brother's house, mm-hmm. and he's married to a very interesting woman. And oh Lord, Aunt Song. <laughs> the thing is, I feel like she's a culmination of a, a lot of women a lot of people I've met in my life I mm-hmm. can't put my finger on it but a lot of characteristics are people in my family on both sides I know this woman I know her very mm-hmm. well very proper southern uh loves Jesus loves Jesus um so they go down there so there's Viola her cousin and the dog Winnie love me is it queenie or winnie queenie winnie Winnie. is the friend oh you're right sorry it's queenie (laughs) i only know because i had the captions on no i i don't know why i put winnie but queenie yes poor little puppy and as soon as troy gets there family drops her off goes back up to new york no they they have to drop off um Nate because Nate is going to another cousin's house okay because they have so many kids nobody's going to take all All five five of the kids so Troy is dropped off and it's her first night there and Aunt Song just starts shaming her about everything her jammies aren't good enough she has to take some of Viola's uh jammies I feel like she is if bless your heart was a person, that's who she is. Yes. So she thinks she's doing this to like be kind, be kind, but really it's just like everything she does is shaming who Troy is and who, like her upbringing. And so, um, yeah, because the difference here is, and it's saying it without saying it where Troy's mom and their family and their lifestyle is like very Afrocentric you know, Mm -hmm. wearing braids, embracing their hair the way it is while, I mean, and it's not unusual, especially in the South where, you know, you pressed your hair, you, you assimilated, Mm -hmm. you did everything you could to kind of fit into the white culture that you were living in. Um, But during the seventies, it was a very big boom for going to, you know, black pride, your hair, you know, going natural with your hair. Mm -hmm. And so it was nice to see that the, the the differences you, it tells you a lot about Ansong and like how she was brought up and she's pushing those views onto mm-hmm. Troy and Troy's kind of and it was at never her. done out of like it's just what she knows or, yeah yeah it was just what she knows and she thought she was being kind the whole time um Ken did point out when they're watching the like televangelist and singing the song mm-hmm. uh she, he goes that's that's the neighbor with the glasses oh is it i didn't see that the man in (laughs) the televangelist video and i looked it up it is tony they just reused that actor for shooting that scene (laughs) one two three the devil's after me four five six he's always throwing sticks seven eight nine he misses every time. Hallelujah, 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 amen. <laughs> that song, that song sticks in my fucking head <laughs> all the time. And I can't sing it out loud because people are like, what? <laughs> I love that journey that we just went on where we just bobbed our heads in time while you sang. <laughs> okay. I did a lot of singing on this episode. <laughs> you did. It's okay. <laughs> Um, 
but I love I love the friendship between Viola and yes. um, Troy and it's it, it speaks so much to like just for me going to visit my cousins when I was younger and I used to go to Delaware so a lot during the summers so that I thought that was cute they would ride the bikes together and even though there's like an age gap mm-hmm. um, play double dutch with, yeah, the, with the, the, the tree yeah yeah <laughs> tied, the jump ropes tied to one end of the tree because there's only two of them <laughs> it was a very very sweet relationship yeah. and they kind of got each other and like viola knew like she kind of eye rolled at some stuff aunt song was doing she kept saying I don't listen. I need to listen to her. She was not my real mama. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh. She. Um, the like, only other part of that visit <laughs> when Queen oh, oh, Okay. Okay. So to set the scene, um, one, I just want to say that the, the whole situation of probably why they adopted Viola is because you could tell they're older. They're an older couple. Mm-hmm. And the husband is just like over it. And he's, he probably said, maybe if I give her a child, she just shut the hell up. But, Leave me alone. For yeah. <laughs> so um, she's really agitated at this point um, on song because she cannot find her, her precious uh, queen, Lala. her dog. Yeah. She can't find him. And so you see this happening in the background throughout the, the scene. Um, and then it's Troy's birthday earlier that day. Mm-hmm. Um, they give her some presents. Of course, the presents are things that they want to give her, not yes. ne- ne- not what Troy actually wants. Like, like a big poofy pink dress. Yep. And a training bra, which of yeah. course, Ansong takes the time to humiliate her by saying, she, well, she ain't going to need that for a while. Mm-hmm. Like, shut up, lady. She does that twice. Because yeah. when she told her to put the nightgown on and- she tries to cover up when Anton comes into the bathroom. She's like, girl, you ain't got nothing to show. And yeah. if I could tell you the times that an aunt has shamed, shamed me about some nonsense, I felt that one. Um, so they give her the presents. Her mom sends a letter with some wonderful jade earrings, elephant earrings for both her mm-hmm. and Viola. Viola doesn't have pierced ears yet. Um, then uh, Troy's had enough. She get to the table. She fucking done. She's like, I'll go home. <laughs> I love how she just stands up and she's like, I'm, I'm want, I want to go home. Well, and Aunt, uh, Aunt Song asked her, "What kind of cake do you want me to make you?" Yes, she says chocolate, and Aunt Song goes, "No sugar. What the fuck kind of cake you gonna make?" No, it wasn't sugar. She said, um unfortunately viola broke out into hives the last time she made chocolate and then viola said "Uh uh-uh that was you mama and (laughs) so it becomes a fight and the dad is like the hell like just get the girl what cake like viola said that she didn't get sick so make the damn cake and yeah then she's like you're always picking on her picking her side over me and it becomes like this nuanced thing where you're kind of learning a little bit about the dynamics between that family and yeah it's like uh she gets dressed she puts on her dress but she, once they get to the the table she's like i'm out this bitch i'm ready to go <laughs> so and, let's go back to the chihuahua so yeah the well she says she wants to have the birthday she aunt song says please have the birthday party that i've planned for you still yeah so they invite two girls over, these twins, and she's still agitated because she can't find Queenie. Mm-hmm. And so she's like telling the kids to help her move the stuff from the couch so that she can open the couch bed or whatever. And the funniest part wasn't ex- the, that scene that we're going to talk about, but right before that, she yells at the twin girls and she's like, she's like, move out the way. Uh, Rachel I don't know whatever your name is move out the way like she gets really (laughs) irritated and I just love that part I don't know why but go ahead tell us what happened so then she goes to open like this little oversized chair that is obviously like a sleeper yeah chair um so she goes to pull the bed out and this motherfucking dog's body pops out that bed like a piece of toast out of a toaster (laughs) and the dog was fucking crushed 
in the chair God. sofa bed and Aunt Song loses it, which understandably my queenie lady my queenie, my queenie. <laughs> and she is inconsolable and all the girls are all just standing around in their party dresses kind of just staring at aunt song losing her fucking shit <laughs> they, like they're like we're ready for bed like <laughs> what's happening and so you see the next the next day um they have buried this dog like Legit, there's a funeral yeah legit funeral for the dog and um Troy's trying to say goodbye she's like bye but queen my queen <laughs> and um so Troy gets taken to to the um what do you call it to the airport and you see like Viola running behind the car saying goodbye to her friend yes. her cousin and one thing we didn't talk about was how when they get to um, Viola's house, when they're in the South, uh, you can see that the way that you're, the oh, way yes. that, that you're looking at it just looks different. I'll let you talk about it from a, a film major standpoint, but. Um, so, yes, it was when the family arrived at the aunt and uncle's house in the country it was created by shooting in widescreen without anamorphically adjusting the image so it looked very stretched yeah and so it was a a choice of spike lee's to shoot it that way and leave it that way because of the it was a visual representation of how the family felt out of place in the country. And so if you notice during uh, Troy's stay in the country, when she's playing with viola and all of that, it's shot normally. Yeah. Once she has those in, when she has those interactions with Aunt Song, it switches back to that widescreen stretched. Uh, format because that's uh, just a visual representation of how <laughs> Troy felt out of place in certain situations and it because it's a visual um, medium it, 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 and we're used to viewing movies in a certain capacity and in a certain uh, ratio aspect when it goes into that it makes the viewer as well feel uncomfortable and uneasy because something is wrong but like everything's still there you can see it you can hear everyone it's just distorted and so it it makes the viewer feel uneasy as well I always so when I got this especially on VHS I used to get really mad because I thought something was wrong with my VHS and my <laughs> mom didn't know what to tell me she's like bitch just watch that movie <laughs> <laughs> so thanks Spike Lee had no idea what what the hell was going on so um, then you see Troy head back to New York. She's picked up at the airport and she's picked up by her uncle and her aunt. And she's mm -hmm. not quite sure why. And so she's like, where's dad? Where's mom? And um, so they kind of make excuses. And then next thing you know, instead of going home, they're at a hospital. And so as soon as Troy gets to the hospital, she's like, who's sick? She's just very intuitive. Yes. You can tell that she kind of just knows something's uh, wrong yeah and then she goes in and they tell her that her mom is sick and they don't really know what's going on yet and so she goes into the hospital room and you see her mom look very different than what she normally you know her braids are out mm -hmm. she has a little mini fro and she looks really tired and she looks sick and you could tell the dad looks like he's could cry at any moment and mm -hmm. um you know, the mom kind of plays it off and Troy's very positive and she's saying that she will literally do whatever she needs. She's like, you're just tired and you need help and I, I'm going to step up even if no one helps me. And it mm -hmm. just, oh, the bawling, the bawling that happens when I watch this scene. I wrote, wait, mama's got cancer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really... For and it. they think she's gonna get to go home they they tell yeah. all the kids she's coming home tomorrow yeah and then um apparently she gets her diagnosis and 
mama never comes back home yeah they they see the scene where all the kids are in the bed watching tv and the dad comes home to tell them that they found cancer and it's just really interesting to see the dynamics of how all the boys even the oldest boys they really start to break down mm-hmm. and troy just kind of just sits there and yeah. doesn't have an emotional reaction at all mm-hmm. um but when she was at the hospital, her mom did whisper some things. She did tell her to take care of her younger brother. Um, things that I think Troy just and, carried with her. And that she's going to be the head of the house and she needs to yeah. step up and take care of everything. Which I feel like on some levels was way too much to be putting on a 10 year old. Yeah, that was um, a lot of a lot of weight to put on a kid's shoulders. Yeah. Um. And so they, they find out she has cancer. And then you cut to another scene and the kids, I don't know if they're going to, it looks like one of the Brooklyn libraries. I, I'm not really sure, but they're singing Danielle's song, Troy singing her uh, one, two, three devils after me song, but they're talking about the funeral. So at this point, you know, that the mom has passed away mm-hmm. and then you go to the funeral and, um, and as any person who's had someone really close to them die, funerals are super weird, especially when it's someone directly affecting you. Mm-hmm. People say the weirdest shit to you, things that sometimes don't comfort you at all. Um, and then you see all these people that like, you know, we're not in your everyday life who are just there and you're, and they speak to that. Um, you see Troy's mm-hmm. oldest brother kind of like pull her in and holds it's her hand hard. and yeah Yeah. and he's they're like who the hell are all these people and um it it was it the way that they did it was sad in itself without having to go over the top where you see everybody kind of like crying in a whole funeral scene oh and the auntie brings her her funeral dress oh the way that Uh troy gathered her aunt up that and oh shoot her out gosh. spit her out it, it was bad and she's like your mom would have loved it and troy goes <laughs> mom hated polyester <laughs> and i was like you you do you troy because in the previous scene when they were at the going up the steps to the library they were talking about like we should just wear our normal clothes like mom would have just wanted us to be us we shouldn't have to dress up for the funeral so the yeah. fact that that they threw in the mom hates <laughs> polyester. I loved it. Yeah, she was the dad has to go get her. And you and he has this moment where he's like, oh fuck. Like, you know, mm-hmm. he doesn't want to deal with this. You know, it's already hard enough. And so he gets Troy to to come down or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then after Troy, the Troy mm-hmm. Troy, uh, that's when she starts breaking down is with the dad. And he's like, I was waiting for you to. Well, right. that no, oh, that no, that was after. the next day. Yeah, yeah, the next day, Troy. Throughout the movie, you see Troy having like really bad dreams, sweating, mm-hmm. you know, and so she she kind of goes through that. She comes downstairs, and she hears it's really her dad. Like I don't know, fighting maybe a rat. I don't know what he's doing, but um, he's in the kitchen and making a lot of noise. And Troy thinks it's her mom yelling at the kids and. Mm-hmm then she realizes it's not so she throws up and then she finally kind of breaks down yeah it was like the I, I think the realization like mom's not coming back this is yeah. a new reality and then shortly thereafter it shows her picking out her little brother's hair in the barber chair yeah where you can see that she's taking sole responsibility yes. like this brother is going to be her responsibility and yeah but I do love like the kids come to the window, ask if Troy, Troy, if her brother can play, Mm -hmm. she says, yes, only a little while, but I do hear as he's running down the street, I do hear Mm -hmm. Troy's oldest brother say, don't go too far. So Mm -hmm. that gives you that sign that yes, he's stepping up. Yeah. So, and then one of the last scenes is snuffy and right-hand man are wreaking havoc in the neighborhood again. Yeah. The glue sniffers. Yeah. (laughs) And so was it the little brother that goes and gets Troy and it's yes. like, they're stealing my money. Yep. And she goes and she Ooh, got, she, she got she, that broomstick. Yeah. She goes and they're like strung out as all get out on a <laughs> stoop and she whacks Snuffy over the head and it takes him a couple of seconds to even react. 
and then he like puts his hand to the back of his head and it's like it's bleeding and she's like essentially don't fuck with my street and so it's kind of shows that she's grown she's now able to stand up to the bullies and not allow them to affect her as they did in the past and that she's really taking what her mom had requested of her to to heart yeah the way he like looks so surprised and he's like Troy why you do that like they're friends like <laughs> yeah get your drug out self out of my fucking neighborhood you nasty son of a bitch oh my god yeah and then you see the end is it ends with soul train we didn't mm-hmm. we missed that part but one of the parts where they were watching tv is they were watching soul train mm-hmm. and the older kids want to watch it the younger kids don't but like that was very much a part of my parents existence watching that show it, it was like the response to america bandstand because mm-hmm. america bandstand didn't have any black people on the show any dancers even though a lot of the dances and the music were coming from you know the black community so they mm-hmm. made that show with don cornelius and um eventually american bandstand towards like the 70s and the 80s they started to say, um, integrate the show mm-hmm. but wasn't as good as no damn soul train i'll tell you that so all in all that was crooklyn what did you think what is now jackie think I thought it was interesting, like I said, because I had no, I wasn't brought up in, and so, and I like learning about different upbringings, different cultures, and the way that their families communicate and interact with one another. I don't think it's something that I would watch over and over. So I would say five day rental, like if you were in town and wanted to watch it, I would definitely watch it with you, but it probably wouldn't be something that I would choose to watch over and over again yeah yeah and it's also just the type of movie where for me I if I'm going to rewatch something it's going to be like an off-the-wall comedy or something that's going to be my go-to like love it we'll watch it a hundred times so but it was not a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination it was very very interesting to watch yeah it's definitely one of my all-time favorites as I said before and the soundtrack is amazing oh it's so good so freaking good I obviously would buy it would buy it again and it's just really hard for me to to like watching that movie doesn't feel like I'm watching a movie it's Mm -hmm. just it feels so there's so much nostalgia in it and it's not just my own childhood but again it brings in stuff that my parents definitely um grew up in because it was more their time period and because I watched it with both of them separately um and how like they would explain things or tell me stories about their childhood or growing up in Brooklyn and you know how excited they would get I I think that's what makes it even better for me personally you know I did you know, the, the part at the end was really, really difficult to watch now, mm-hmm. probably more than ever, because when I was younger, I watched it and it was sad, but now like losing a parent, it just hits different. Yeah. Um, I'm just so, so thankful that I did not lose my parent at that age. That would have been, I couldn't even imagine. So such a good movie. I don't know if I can watch it over and over again, only because it's just too emotional. (laughs) It's good, but it's too emotional. But I do think it's a predecessor to Everybody Hates Chris, which Mm -hmm. is, you know, Chris Rock's TV show and growing up in the 80s for him in Brooklyn. So I, I love Black people in regular old environments, just living. There was, you know, the pain that they had in this movie was not, anything to do with racism or 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 race just black pain in that way and Mm -hmm. I very much like where I can see just representation of black people just doing normal shit yeah so not a lot of movies like that in that time period I think probably the next best one would probably be love and basketball later down the line yeah so that was my my birthday edition happy birthday to him now jackie if we're gonna do that you gotta see the sing the stevie wonder version like happy birthday to ya happy birthday to ya 
happy birthday <laughs> that's that's the one we gotta do <laughs> well please find us on tiktok instagram facebook twitter at no more late fees and continue to listen on whatever you're listening to this on now <laughs> thanks for finding us yeah. uh, tell a friend tell a lot of friends share it share it share it and you can find us on Google Voice. Please call, leave a message. Uh, we welcome feedback. Tell us if you liked or didn't like this movie, what your rating would be, suggestions for future episodes, any blockbuster stories you have if you were a former video rental employee. And the number is 909 601 MLF. Again, that's 909-601-6653. And catch us back next week. We will be doing Lilo and Stitch, our first animated feature and my favorite animated Disney movie. So until next time, be kind and rewind.